Welcome to Face Forward, the inspiring change podcast on all things internal communications, engagement, leadership, and change. So welcome to Face Forward, the Inspire Change podcast on all things internal communications, engagement, leadership and change. It's no surprise that when you look at the parallels between sports and business that so many sports people write leadership books, that so many sports people and people involved in sport go on to be very popular after dinner speakers um, because the parallels between sport and business and I think particularly leadership and coaching are really, really strong. And I'm delighted today to be joined on the podcast by Mike Ruddock. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Scott. Yeah. Um, Let me just, I I ran through your your wiki this morning. um, And I'm sure you'll have lots of examples to give us of (laughs) of things that have happened. But let me just pull out a few um, things that kind of really struck me from your your coaching career, which has been a long one. and And we'll talk about the reasons for that maybe later. You coached Swansea to beat Australia in 1992 when they were world champions, named Welsh Coach of the Year in 92 and 2005, and that was the same year that you took Wales to a Six Nations Grand Slam. Um, that was the first time since 1978 that Wales had a Grand Slam. You coached the Barbarians, and I'm particularly interested in that, so we're going to come back to that later, and the Ireland 20s. But today finds you at Lansdowne, where earlier this year, probably one of the most exciting games I've seen on TV, uh, Lansdowne beat Cork Home to win the Ulster Bank All-Ireland League. And as a result of that, uh, you were named uh, All-Ireland Division 1A Coach of the Year. So it's been some year so far. Yeah, yeah. I keep hanging around like a bad bad smell, I suppose. Um, But, no, I love coaching. uh, I'm passionate about it. I always... uh, I've tried to, you know, to do my best if, if you like, whatever I've gone. And, uh, I like winning, and um, I think that was ingrained into me in my background. I grew up in the in the Welsh Valley towns, the coal mining towns, uh, Democratic People's Republic of Blaenau, a uh, little small town up in uh, in the Gwent Valleys, where you know everyone really was a, a steel worker or a coal miner, and uh, you were you were sort of taught really to to hate the next valley and the next team. And tribalism sort of dominated the, you know, the the, the, the landscape really. And uh, once you started playing rugby, it was it was it was a matter of pride. You had to try and beat the teams, uh, surrounding teams. It was it was really important. So, I think that competitive edge is something I've probably taken into my into my coaching as well. And um, I actually hate losing. Last season we only lost two matches all season. Um, and uh, and you know I always sort of. The boys always know uh, I'm in not so great great form after that, but uh, thankfully we came through and uh, we won the important matches that mattered. But um, yeah, being competitive, I had to finish uh, my my own rugby career quite early. I got uh, injured in an accident at work. I fractured my skull. I broke my back. So really, it was a long way back to get back into some sort of sport. And um, uh, when I was advised to stop playing at 27, you know, it was very difficult really to sort of cut yourself away from the dressing room. So. I embarked on a, a Welsh Rugby Union coaching course. Uh, did my level two, a week's intensive course uh, in Swansea. Uh, came back from that and uh, coached my village team, Blainer, and managed to lose the first four matches. So uh, I found out pretty quickly how fickle co- coaching could be, and uh, I was given a yellow card by the committee and warned if we didn't shape up, I'd be out the door. Thankfully, we uh, we won the next game and. Uh, we won the rest and ended up winning the league. But I think the important learning for me there was I came back from the coaching course thinking, right, you know, I've had this week's intensive coaching and I've learned so much. I'm going to, you know, coach the team to do this, this and this. And it's going to be a one-man band and I know exactly where I'm going to go and I've got this vision for the team. But, you know, when I sat down after we'd lost four games with the, some of the senior lads and said, look, you know, where am I going wrong? Because, you know, we should be better than this. The guy said, well, we just don't feel we, we're fit enough. So you're doing some, some great work in terms of our skill development. But, you know, this team has always functioned better when our engine's better, when we got more fuel in the tank, when we're really fit. And, uh, again, that was a great learning for me in terms of, you know, as a coach, it's, it's really important that you've got, um, you know, a vision for the team and you know the sort of game you want the team to play. But it's really important to keep in touch with the key members of the team to see if everyone's aligned and things are working out as you hope they would be. And actually I think there's there, there's such a strong parallel there between 
between rugby in this case or sport and business that it's so easy to go off and we do it all the time in work that we go on a week or two's course and we come back and we change everything and we're the expert we know the direction Absolutely. but in actual fact we're thinking about the really clever stuff the leading edge stuff but actually it's the really important stuff which in that case was fitness of the team yeah. which made the difference and I think I, I was listening to um, to Kieran's uh, podcast earlier on that you spoke on there and you said that it was the, as a result of that that you went on to then win that, the league that year. Yeah, we won the league that year. We did, I don't we lost another game, and um, you know, but I wouldn't have done it, uh, or we wouldn't have achieved it as a team unless we had that frank and honest conversation uh, where we had to put the team first, you know. And um, I had to drop my ego pretty quickly. Not I think I've ever really had one, but um, you know, it was a uh, it was a matter of sort of uh, you know swallowing your pride and saying, "Hands up, guys! I'm a little bit lost here. I'm a rookie coach. Can you help me?" Yeah. Um, and I sometimes, as a leader, it's, it's you know it, it it it's 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 a big step to do. But sometimes, as a leader, you've got to be prepared to sit down and say, guys, you know, we're not performing in a way that I'd hope we uh, we perform. You know, I've put in these difficult different strategies, these sort of skill development uh, and team development processes, but for some reason, we're not hitting the outcomes. You know, you know, what's your view on things? You know, what's your view on things? You know. Where do you think we could improve? What's our work on? Uh, and in um, you know in, in in the coaching I do, I've got you know very simple sort of debrief uh, preview type uh, tools where we look at how the team you know what 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 skills can we and strategies can we maintain to a high level, a high standard, and what can we work on to improve? And simple as that, you know, we we either look at what we, we need to maintain to a high level or what we need to work on, even if we're functioning fairly well, we our work ons are really what we focus on and what we need to improve on, you know, and keeping an eye on those work ons are really important. Yeah. There was a story again from, from Kieran's podcast earlier that kind of predated your, your coaching training when you were in the car and your dad was bringing you to one of the um one of the medical uh, appointments after your accident and he said to you you know you can't play anymore you've been told that you can't play anymore what are you going to do now and you said to him I'm going to be a coach and as you said I think in that story it wasn't until almost you said it out loud because hmm. for a lot of people that would be a mad idea 26 27 I'm going to be a coach and it wasn't until you said that almost that it became real yeah now I'm no expert on the laws of the universe, but I've said to my, my my children and my daughter in particular, you know, never be afraid to announce your intentions or declare your intentions, um, you know, nice and loud to the universe, because very often, unless the universe knows, uh, it ain't going to happen, you know. So, uh, in fact, um, that particular moment you're talking about, I had played for the Welsh schoolboys, I'd played for the Welsh B team, which was like the second team. I'd played, I'd sort of been involved with the Welsh squad. Um, I was on the verge of playing for Wales, uh, you know, subject to popular opinion. And um, I got this injury, I got this accident, you know. So um, uh, my dad said, well, look, you know, you, you can't play anymore. I said, well, if I can't play for Wales, then I'm going to coach Wales. So I actually said more than just going to coach, I'm going to coach Wales. Coach Wales. Um, and lo and behold, I did, uh, you know, 20 odd years later, and thankfully, had a bit of success as well. Because, amazing things with yeah, them, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I think don't be afraid. You know, again, you know, as a leader, is is to be clear about what you want to achieve and what your goals are, and don't be afraid to tell people um, that, that that you want to achieve that. You know, and okay, sometimes you know you you might not get to, to to that goal, you might not achieve that goal, but it's all about the process, trying to get there and improving along the way. You know, and I think that's the key thing for me. And there's two strings of three two things that strike me from what you've just said there for the past few minutes. One, not having a fear of failure, to actually it be okay to fail as long as you learn and move on. Um, and, the, and the second thing being around, you know, as a leader, not always having the answers. Because I think that certainly in the business world, people tend to kind of turn to their boss when things are going wrong. They turn to their boss for all the answers. They turn to the leader to tell them when things are, are going wrong. And lots of leaders will look at that and go, yes, well, you're my team. It's like a mother duck with a line of ducks following them. I have to make sure that you don't get into trouble. It's my job to make sure you know where you're going. And actually, sometimes they need to have the humility to be yeah. able to, to kind of step back and go, actually, you know what, lads? I don't have all the answers. Yeah. And that's tough for a leader. It is. But also, there's a couple of other things. It, you know, it's, it's, 
you know, how will that individual grow under your leadership if you just tell them the answer every time? And sometimes you might not even know the answer, but you could try and bluff it or dress it up a little bit to make it sound like you had the answer, which is, is just not the way to go, in my opinion. So my first question, whenever someone comes up to me and, and says, what should I do? You know, how should I do in this situation? You know, my first question is, well, what do you think? You know, and then let's explore that. For example, what's the weather conditions like? Because that could affect your decision making in terms of the skill you need to use. What does the scoreboard say? Are we chasing the game? Are we winning by 10 points? You know, what are the strengths of the opposition? So there's a number of dynamic variables that we need to put into our decision making equation. Um, it's, it, it, you know, you can't just say, oh, this is the answer. We have to discuss a lot of different aspects of that to, to sort of come to the right um, you know, decision. But ultimately, if if you just tell the answers all the time, then, then really, how is that person going to grow? So the big point, I think, is to sort of try and give that person the opportunity to try and go away and think about how you could improve that, come back even uh, you know, a few hours later and say, well, you know, did you make any progress there? Uh, yes or no, and discuss it from there, really. But I'll give you another example, and I know you want to talk about the power of stories at some stage, and um, I always tell this story in terms of... Um, trying to find the right answers, you know, as a leader um, and, and, and not be afraid to offer it up to the group. And um, we, uh, and I think the other point you made as well, which is really important about failure, not being afraid to fail. I fail loads of times. Um, you know, we, we won two championships to Swansea. We beat uh, Australia, as you said, to the world champions. And then, so I thought I was the best coach in the world. And then South Africa came well, You were for that moment. <laughs> you were the best coach in the world for that moment. <laughs> take, them, yeah. take them when they happen. Yeah, and all the supporters all the supporters of the team thought so. But then a week later, <laughs> when we lost to South Africa by about 70 points, <laughs> I was the worst coach in the world. Um, and we were devastated. And... Um, you know, I certainly had to pick the team up, you know, there we were fancied to beat uh, South Africa, who then went on to win the World Cup a year later. Um, but they just walked us out of the door, you know, they were on a different level. So we had to try and get ourselves back from that. And we, we drew a team called Neath six weeks later in the, in the Welsh Cup. And in the, in the interim period, we pretty much lost five games, six games, and everyone was writing us off. My, my, my sort of position as coach was uh, now under pressure and the tenuous, massive... Tenuous. Yeah, yeah, very tenuous. And... Um, but what I said after this defeat was, well, okay, well, we need to we need to be fit and strong. We've probably lulled a bit in terms of the work rate that we've done. So, Neath, their trademarks as a team are they're the fittest team in Welsh rugby and the most aggressive team in Welsh rugby. We've always been this most skillful team in Welsh rugby. We've always been really fit and we've always been really aggressive. Probably lost a couple of those elements along the way. So, we're going to work on our fitness, work on our um, aggression, our physicality over the next couple of weeks. We did that. We arrived at the, the week before the Neath game. No one was going to bet on us to win the game. Everyone was writing us off. I said to the guys, look, we've definitely made massive improvements. Training has gone fantastically well. I know we've lost a couple of these games in the interim, but our focus and our goal now is to beat Neath away in Neath. And uh, our physical side of things are really good. Our technical side, the game plan's good. Uh, our tactical side I'm really comfortable with the, the, the stuff we've been working on and the target areas we've been working towards let's talk about the mental side is there anything we've missed out on the mental side and one of the boys put his hand up who's our hooker you know, and he was the last coal miner to work for to play for Wales that was playing for us and he put his hand up and he said look um, the way I see it it's like the the good cowboy in a white hat riding into um, you know the saloon and, take, and walking through the saloon doors and every other cowboy there's 35 cowboys there all in black hats. Very intimidating. I said, Gary, you know, what are we talking about? Yeah, let's talk about rugby. Why are we talking about cowboys? He said, because it's the same situation. He said, Neath play in black. It's very intimidating. They've got a very passionate crowd behind them. Uh, we are the good guys. We play in white. We go over there. It's exactly like that that uh, cowboy walking into the saloon. You know, you're a, you're a bit too nice, you know, in, in white. And they, they get in for you. I said, well, what, what do you suggest there? He said, well, our away kit is navy. We never wear it. So let's wear our away kit, which is a navy jersey. And the, the onus is on the home team then to change their jersey. So we kept it a secret till the last minute. And then the referee came in. He said, oh, there's a clash of jerseys here because we'd warmed up in T-shirts. He said, I'll have to get the home team to change. Well, you know, I couldn't repeat some of the things their team manager said. They were trying to knock the door down into our change rooms with 30 seconds to go, call us everything under the sun. Next thing, their, their change kit was uh, turquoise. 
and they suddenly weren't nice. as frightening. No, <laughs> <laughs> no they weren't. <laughs> they weren't the bad guys in black anymore. And we proceeded to, to, to beat them, and uh, the press loved it. You know, they loved this this story. But it all came from one of the group, from one of the players. It wasn't from me as the leader, uh, but you know, the pride I've got in that particular story is I asked the question. We could have just gone on charging in thinking okay uh, you know we, we, we've done the work we needed to do but we, we, we looked at our backstop position so there's anything we haven't covered off you know and this guy that you know the guy we least thought of would come up with the answers came up with the answers and um, you know we, we, we won that game then we went to uh, Cardiff uh, we'd won the league we played those in the semi-final beat them in the semi-final after extra time because of the extra fitness work we'd done the weeks earlier uh, and then we, uh, we we won the final against a very good Pawnee Pre team as well in, in Cardiff Arms Park so to, from suddenly having been failed if you like against South Africa badly we then won the, the Welsh Cup uh, in front of 70,000 people uh, for only the second time in the club's history you know? so it's how you come back from failure I think is important but also if you can get engagement with a group and get people coming up with some ideas as well that can help I think that's that's when it, when you've got that as a leader uh, then you, you think you're in a good place and often I think we can look over those people who maybe are just quiet by nature we yeah. tend to we tend to turn to the gobby shouty ones um, thinking they've got all the answers when actually it's the person that's just quietly in the background thinking and mulling over things I've got to come out with a gem yeah and I think sometimes you've just got to draw it out and give them the opportunity and as you said and um there's two types of leaders, as you know, when you look at the academic sort of literature on it. There's, there's the formalised leaders, you know, your, your captains, your, your vice captains, uh, and then there's your informal leaders, guys who just just do the right things, say the right things, their behaviours, their values are fantastic. Um, their trademarks as a person, as a player, w- would mark them out as the people that you, you, you look up to uh, and, and people want to follow. Now, they might not be shouting and bowling or offering up great leadership uh, advice uh, but you know everyone respects them and as you said you might just want to draw something out of those people from time to time that could be a massive relevance and that's almost that for me that's almost the kind of the cultural underbelly of a team or an organization is the stuff that goes on behind the kind of the hierarchy behind yeah. the the coach, the captain, the you know, the sub captain. You know, it's it, it's about what happens within the team, and that and that's cultural. It is, and also I think that's part of the skill of the leader is to identify that there are guys there. The press could be underestimated, or ladies there could be underestimated, um, or people within the the organisation that perhaps could be listened to uh, and could have a valid point. You know, and perhaps need to be engaged. Mm. Mm. It's interesting. There was um, there was something that Kieran mentioned again on his on his podcast about you know being the one that still goes and cleans the toilets in yeah. the in the gym that he runs around the corner, and yet people say to him, "Well, why why would you do that when you can get someone else to do that?" And his response was, "Well, when I ask someone else to do it, there's a particular quality, and I've done it, mm. so I can ask them to do it, and that's okay." And, and it's interesting that James Kerr, I don't know if you've ever read his book Legacy about the All Blacks, yeah, a leadership book about about um, the All Blacks. It's worth a look if, if yeah, read his fantastic um, book. Yeah. There's so yeah. much in that, yeah. And he talks about sweeping the sheds, that yeah. whole idea of a couple of the players staying back at the end. Hmm. It's not um, it's not because they've done something wrong. It's not because they are the, the the least strong players or the newest in the door. Two players just literally sweep the sheds, and that whole idea that all the jobs need to get done and none of us is too big to do that job. Yeah, I th- but I think, again, and I've, I've worked with Steve Hansen, who's, uh, who's, who's done a marvellous job there with the All Blacks and, and, and sort of been part of, the, of, of that, uh, that coaching team that's helped to engender those sort of values. Um, you know, for me, what I took from that and what I've seen from how it operates as well is um, it, it's not just about, you know, the fact that two guys are sweeping the shed and, and, and sort of remembering if you like the the basic values of rugby that you know you you, you arrive and you, you respect the opposition and you respect the you know the change rooms you want to beat them but you don't want to leave a mess and you you know you, you make sure your reputation is good that way it's a much deeper thing for me I think it's it's about okay so most teams have a a baggage master a kit man who, who puts out the jerseys who provides you know the studs if you need them. If you need a change of shorts, if you need laces for your boots, whatever you need, these guys have got them. They're remarkable uh, human beings, you know. They just sort of, 
they Check seem to have everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They seem to have everything. Yeah, you know, we've got a battery for my speaker, for my headphones. Yeah, yeah. So they seem to have everything. And um, of course, on a match day, uh, and particularly when you clear up after, you know, after a match, these guys are hugging, you know, water bottles. They're hugging kit bags. They're hugging, uh, you know, rugby balls around the place, cones, tracksuits. Uh, bibs, you know, for warm ups. There's all sorts of equipment. They've got to move in and out of of, of the changing rooms. And to me, the biggest thing there is that these guys recognise that. So he's he's not the bottom of the food chain, if you know what I mean, in terms of the organisation, because they respect that guy and what he brings to it and what he does. They want to help him out. So a lot of guys help up, help by carrying out the kit and, and moving the kit on, and then two guys then will clean the change room. So the kit guy is not left because very often it can be an elderly guy as well. He's not left trying to tidy. you know tidy everything up and move all the kit around and sweep the change rooms. And again, so if you've got that level of teamwork and that level of cohesion and unity sort of off the field in those smaller areas, the unseen areas, you know, then it's going to be like that on the field. You know, when the pressure comes on, these guys are going to help each other, work for each other, and go that extra mile for each other. I think it's a, and and, and that's that's why the All Blacks, those sorts of things, um, permeate the whole organisation and the whole team and the whole philosophy of what they're about, really. And that's why it's so difficult to beat. Oh, isn't it interesting? They they are such seemingly tiny, tiny things, yet so fundamentally important. Yeah, and they're all aligned, of course, to 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 team unity and team cohesion, um, and making sure as well that nobody's too big, if you like, um, for the group that that everyone respects uh, everyone else and what their role is in in the, in the team and the group, and that's why you got to respect someone like Johnny Sexton so much. You know, he's always. You know, they're on TV, he's man of the match, he's kicking the winning penalty, he's kicking the winning goals. But he'll be the first to come off and say, Well, do you know what? I couldn't have kicked that penalty if the front row hadn't have dominated that last scrum. And you worked, know? It, worked it yeah. 40 metres up the pitch. Exactly. Yeah. Or if those guys, as exactly as you said, hadn't done the hard yards, picked them, went, Give me a, an armchair right to kick that drop goal uh, against France, which gave them the momentum to go on for the, mm. the grand slam. So, you know. Johnny Sexton is is a fantastic guy, great role model, very humble, but he buys into team, you know, and I think that's that's so so important. And when you got a, you know one of your stand up players, making sure that everyone else is the message is clear that everyone's respected mm-hmm. for their hard work, then that's a fantastic, uh, you know, that's a fantastic sort of uh, feeling and vibe for the for the whole group. Yeah, absolutely. And what do you think from a, from a communications perspective? What do you think is the role of a leader, whether it be a, a, a coach in your position or somebody in business leading a team? What's their role as a communicator? How, do, how does that work? Well, I think it can be very situational, you know. And you, you know, very often when I've gone into different teams and I've I've worked with a lot of teams now, you you sort of have a gut feeling, you know, and you've got to trust that as a coach, and you you sort of. You, you, you sort of rely on that, but having said that, if you've got time and if you've got the opportunity, you can you can do a bit more uh, homework and perhaps look through tapes or examine the books of the business or look at how they performed and talk to people about the internal work into the of the company. So that can help to tweak that gut feeling of how you want to shape things, if you like. So the more information you get, the better. Um, but ultimately, then once you've arrived at the point where you think, okay, well, I've got an, an idea of, of what the plan should be. Um, then really I think you're looking at creating some sort of vision uh, for the team and sharing that vision so that everyone's clear about it uh, and trying to align all your practices and your your methods and your processes to that vision. So, for example, when I went into Wales uh, to coach Wales, I just felt that, um, you know, the team was scoring lots of points but they were getting beaten by lots of points as well, you know, and uh, they scored 35 and lose because they, they conceded 40. So you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to realise that we need to improve the defence. And, you know, the the set piece at the time wasn't particularly good, particularly in the scrum. Um, so I wanted to put a, a selection together that I thought could improve that area. Um, and then I aligned the vision, if you like, to, 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 to you know, to sort of enc- in, you know, encompass that and maintain the things they were doing well. So I looked at the word Wales and I said, OK, the W will stand for... For, for winning, so we develop that winning, winning mindset, you know, so we, we really put pressure on ourselves to, to want to win every game, and, and I know everyone sort of wants to do that at the international level anyway, but there's like an expectation that we're going to do it, 
the W also stood for width. You know, we want to play with with some good width, and we want to get that ball wide early as as well. Uh, the A stood for aggressive aggressive defence. So we want to put a focus on on our our defence and get off the line quicker than we'd seen before. I brought in a new defence coach, a guy I'd worked with before in the new book, Gwent Dragons, who was an ex rugby league guy. He was a fantastic defence coach, a guy called Clive Griffiths, and he he really turned our defence around and made us very mean. Um, the L in the word Wales was was for a license to thrill. So we weren't really looking to come down hard on guys if they made a mistake, drop the ball. Like if we're going to say to you, go and play with width, go and play, with, you know, have a license to, to play, it's and then suddenly drop. say, oh, you drop that, yeah. we drop you out the team, yeah. then you know that team will tighten up. So we needed to, you know, I just felt we we hadn't won anything. Well, as you said, for 27 years we hadn't won the, the championship or Grand Slam for 27 years. So there wasn't a great expectation. I was quite lucky there. And I think the Welsh people, and again, knowing the culture and knowing the mindset of the Welsh people helped me because I knew that people would uh, accept mistakes as long as we were trying to play and progress and go forward as a better team. Um, and so we give them a licence to play. Um, I give guys certain roles like a, like a counter-attack captain, a full-back, and a tap-and-go captain and nine. Things that we wouldn't have done with other teams, perhaps, if we'd had stronger forwards, but... We weren't going to overcome the might of France and, and England with our pack, so we had to keep the ball mobile. So we, we gave guys slightly different roles that way. Um, we, we we looked at the, the the word the letter E, sorry, uh, and again just promoted that that sort of exciting style. You know, again it was to the forefront, and the S was for having a smile on our face and keeping our standards high and our skills high. So there was a there was a triple on the S, but all those things. Whenever we went into you know, the team talk or whenever we went into half time or whenever we went into a debrief, we could say, okay, did we play with width? Did we have an aggressive defence? Why are we not trying to play? Why are we, you know, why is there no energy? You've got a license to thrill. You know, let's be excited in what we do and let's look at our skills. And, you know, so it's easy then. Everything can be referred back to that, uh, back to that vision. Which is great and really easy for someone yeah. to remember. I remember I was chatting to a guy who used to play for the Cork Hurlers and he was the captain for a while. And they had a flag, a Cork flag. And of course, a little like the Welsh, you know, people in Cork are, are fiercely proud of that, of, of, of being Corkonians. And they had a flag and they decided there were four or five things that they were going to sign up to do every match. And they all signed the flag. Fantastic. And that flag came with them and got hung up Brilliant. in the dressing room every single match yeah. every single match yeah. um, which was something that they could be there be proud of and make sure that you know it, it was something that they followed a little bit like using an acronym like, like Wales yeah, yeah absolutely and uh, that would tie in with something I, I, I talk about which uh, would be our trademarks so you know four or five things behaviours that we we look at and we'd look to bring every week whether it's in the gym we've got you know four or five behaviours like the boys must put their weights away after them for example must arrive on time and make sure they fill in their sheets for their programme and their diet. So it's four or five behaviours. It's the same with when we when we step over the white line and we, we, we go on the field. There's four or five behaviours we want. Um, you know, for example, bring in, bring in energy, bring in physicality. Um, now, we can't always say that we're going to catch and pass every ball perfectly. We can't always say that we're going to kick every goal. We can't always going to say we can win every lineup. We want to, but we we can bring the attitude to, to do it. We can try our hardest. Yes, exactly. So those trademarks would be would be would be big. So, you know, it's the same in the workplace. You know, so people are going to make mistakes. That's when you identify as a leader. You need to help them, coach them, mentor them. Um, but at least they're trying because they're making the mistake. It's you know, it's the people who are not doing anything and not adding to your energy, your productivity, and not pushing themselves to try and be better um, obviously that you've got a question whether they're going to take you forward in the organisation you know I love that saying perfection is the enemy of progress <laughs> that <laughs> if we wait yeah. until we're absolutely perfect at something yeah. before trying to do it nothing ever happens absolutely it's, it's better to try something at 70% or 80% and maybe fail than not to try at all because you haven't got to 100% absolutely and you've got to realise that we're all you know on a learning curve we never stop learning and and we can't control any. You, know, you control what goes on, perhaps within the team or within the building, but you can't control the environment outside, mm. or what the opposition do and what the competitors do. It so it can be very dynamic. As if you wait till you think, okay, we've nailed the system now, we'll introduce it. Um, things have progressed, and, and somebody's already put systems in elsewhere, or 
tactics in elsewhere for, for in other teams that have you know that are far in front of the one mm. you're still trying to perfect. Mm. I'm conscious of time. I'm going to ask you one last question, but I have absolutely no doubt at all that we'll be meeting again and you're going to be back <laughs> on this podcast because I've literally got a hundred ideas in my head of stuff we haven't even talked about yet. All right, cool. Um, what leadership advice would you give to your 20-year-old self, knowing what you know now? Yeah, well, I, I, I probably doubted myself quite a bit as a leader, you know, particularly in the early days. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, when I finally studied some, some leadership, uh, I did a, a diploma in uh, Northumbria University in leadership and management. And when I finally looked into the academic side, one the, the big thing I took out of, of the study was... You know the, the self awareness um, side of things, and 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 the realization that we're all unique and we're all different, and we're all individual. And probably I, I probably compared myself to other coaches a bit. And I thought, oh, perhaps I want to be a bit like more like him, or a bit more like him. Uh, instead of just saying, hey man, you know, you are who you are. You, you're from the background you're from. You've got these experiences. You've got these life learnings. Um, just be you and be comfortable, and be happy with that. And um, so if I was giving that advice to my 20-year-old uh, self, I'd just say, look, you know, love yourself, uh, don't doubt yourself, just go out and try your best. And if you stick to your principles and your values and and, and, and the behaviours that have got you this far in life, you'll be absolutely fine, you know? And just be, don't be afraid to keep learning. And don't be afraid to fail as well. Because, you know, some of my greatest moments have been out to failing. And, um, you know, uh, the big thing I, I sort of try to, talk to uh, young coaches about is bounce back ability because when, you, when you're when young you don't think you'll ever fail but we all do in sport and uh, it comes back to bite you now and again but it's how you come back from that and uh, is, is the huge thing so look love yourself believe in yourself and don't doubt yourself um, there will be ups and downs but you'll get there excellent um, as I say I have no doubt and I'd, I'd love you to come back on because I think there are a hundred things that we haven't even touched on from my notes that I have here uh, but for now Mike uh, it's been a real pleasure meeting you and having you on thanks so much thank you Scott top man thanks for listening for more on Inspiring Change to read our blog and to listen to other podcasts please visit inspiringchange.ie